Welcome everyone. A couple of announcements before we get started. Tomorrow, Hershey Dwoskin is back for his fall. Uh, so two o'clock right here as well as online. And then Wednesday night, we've got Dr. Rosenberg launching his book at 6.30 p.m. You can also stream online or come in person, but if you are coming in person, you must register because we're buying cookies and we have to know how many. <laughs> so without further ado, please give a big round of applause for Dr. Joe Schwartz and Science Demystified. Wow, you're getting cookies. How lucky you are. What would you like to hear about today? It doesn't matter what you want because it's what I decide that you're going to hear about. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, you're going to hear about some interesting things in science because no matter what, no matter which day it is, there's always something that comes up that's interesting. But I want to talk about a couple of things that came up during the summer. One of them, of course, was uh, Oppenheimer, the movie. And it was pretty good, uh, but I want to give you some insight into the science behind that. And then, of course, along with uh, Oppenheimer this summer was the Barbie movie. Now you go, oh, 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 how many of you saw it? Oh, good. It was actually very interesting especially if you know some of the backstory. Okay, I think if you go in there cold and you know nothing about Barbie and you know nothing about uh, Ruth Handler, the, the founder of, of the company, then it just looks like some bizarre, you know, juxtaposition of scenes. But if you know something about the history, it was really very interesting and very well done. So I want to take you behind the scenes a little bit. <clears throat> well, first, in front of the scenes. Um, I think they did just a remarkable job in creating a real life world of something in Barbie world. You know, it doesn't really exist in real life, of course, but they built the whole town and made everything look like it was real. I mean, Ken and Barbie uh, looked like the dolls. It was really, really quite interesting how they did that technically. But anyway, that's not the, that's not the story that we're uh, really uh, after here. Uh, the story really starts with uh, Ruth Handler a uh, Jewish lady, of course, and uh, she was the, uh, the founder of the company. The company, of course, is Mattel, which is still one of the largest uh, toy companies uh, in, the in the world. And uh, she was uh, in the movie, not her, I mean, actress, of course, it was uh, Rhea Perlman from Cheers fame, who portrayed her and portrayed her uh, very well. And see, this is also a situation where if you don't know any of the backstory, you miss the nuances and you, you miss all the little comments that were made about the IRS, for example, the Internal Revenue Service. And, you know, I'll tell you in a minute how she got into trouble with that. So there are a lot of these indulgences in the movie, which were very, very cleverly done. <clears throat> anyway, the real story starts in the 1950s when uh, Ruth Handler was in Europe, in Switzerland actually, with her family. And uh, they found a doll in a store. And this was the doll that was being sold in, in, um, in Switzerland at, the, at that time. Uh, it was uh, Build Lily, a little polyester doll. And she had never seen anything like that. 
because of course in America all the dolls you know were the traditional dolls that look like little babies whatever fat and chubby and uh, here was a doll that looked like a woman and this she had never seen anything like that so she actually decided to come out with a doll here in North America modeled on uh, on that called her Barbie because her daughter was called Barbie so the doll was named after Ruth Handler's daughter, uh, uh, Barbie. And uh, as you can see, they shaped her very much like the doll that she saw in Switzerland. That was the original one, actually. It was in a bathing suit. It was made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which later turned out to be an issue because polyvinyl chloride doesn't stand up too well to high temperatures. And uh, some of the older dolls are now decomposing, uh, you know, so that, that, that is a problem. Um, this one, if you have one of the originals, in its container, in its box, unopened, how much do you think? Millions, millions, yeah. That, of course, is because they don't exist, right? Because nobody bought a doll in those days and said, well, let me keep this for 50 years to see what, what will happen. Uh, but uh, uh, some of the original ones, although they're not in the original box, but people still have some of the original, they're worth a lot as well. So look through your grandchildren's uh, toy boxes on the off chance that, I mean, you've if you see that one, never mind if it's not in the box, uh, if you see that one with this bathing suit, you'll, you'll be rich. Uh, anyway, uh, she founded the company with her husband, uh, Elliot, and uh, Mattel, the E-L comes from uh, uh, Elliot, and they hired um, a guy who before had been working for Raytheon, which was an uh, uh, high-tech company at that time, an airplane manufacturer, actually the name of Jack Ryan, who really was the brains behind creating the doll uh, and making it with limbs that could actually move. He was a very interesting guy. He was married five times, uh, once to Jaja Gabor, and uh, he designed the original doll. And here is the patent, 1959, which is when this came out. And it was designed so that her legs could uh, bend and her arms could bend. And her anatomy was pretty accurate, except for one part. And if you saw the movie, you know that she was missing essentially the female genitalia, which in the movie they, they uh, addressed very, very cleverly. Uh, anyway, this guy, Jack Ryan, he, he was really quite something. They gave him a piece of the company originally, low percentage, but of course the company made billions, so he became very, very rich. And he built himself this house in, in Los Angeles, a castle, where he, he held all kinds of outrageous parties. He was a big gambler. Uh, he was a big uh, womanizer, and again, that, that story is pretty well told um, in the movie. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ruth Handler uh, developed uh, breast cancer, and she made another contribution because she had some knowledge of working with plastics, of course, with, with the doll, and she made the first prosthesis for uh, women who had to have a mastectomy. And uh, she uh, also had some personal troubles though. She was indicted for basically having uh, uh, cheated on her taxes and other, uh, other issues. But anyway, uh, she left the company, uh, kicked out of the company in 1975, but the company still, uh, exists today, and the Barbie doll has uh, developed. And uh, as you can see from the original, uh, of course, now they have every kind of culture present and, and uh, 
you know, you have Barbies in, in wheelchairs, you have uh, Barbies with Down syndrome. Really, it's been quite something. So girls have been playing with the Barbie doll now for uh, what was it, about 70 years. It's a, it's a, a long time. And issues have arisen, scientific issues. Here's this one. In this peer-reviewed article in a, a psychology journal, they argue that because young girls play with Barbie, which has unrealistic dimensions, they develop a false view of what a woman should look like. And they claim that this has created problems. Here's their conclusion. Overall, these studies show an effect of playing with ultra thin fashion dolls, that's of course Barbie, on girls' own body, which may represent a risk to the body esteem. We strongly urge future research on the impacts of doll play on body image to consider the potential importance of own age versus adult dolls use of baseline testing and how combination of toys in the real world play settings may dilute or magnify these experimental impacts. So in, they have studied girls who play with Barbie dolls and girls who played with these dolls, Lottie and Dora, which they say are more realistic and closer to the age of the, of the children. And that this gives them sort of a better background in what to expect of, uh, of themselves. Anyway, it was an interesting story. There's, you, you know, there's all kinds of stories about it on the internet you, you can read. And if you really want to see something interesting, go see the Barbie exhibit, which is here in Montreal. It's in the Centre Montreal uh, downtown. It is really worthwhile seeing. It's one of the most interesting exhibits that, that you'll see. History of the Barbie doll from, uh, from the original, although they do not have an original there. But the history from, from there of all the costumes, the national, uh, national costumes, I mean, it is really, really well done. I think it's just closed now for a short time because they're redoing it. Uh, but uh, can see uh, their national costumes, uh, dressed up in all kinds of uh, of costumes. I mean, it's really it's a, it's a whole world, uh, including you know things like this, the the monsters. Uh, there's Barbie as you know leading the in the monsters. It's well worth seeing, and the costumes are are just. Uh, incredible. Anyway, uh, I did have a personal interest in Barbie because I had a call on the radio one day. How do you remove lipstick from the face of Barbie? The lady was quite panicked because uh, her daughter uh, was very, very upset. Apparently what she had done is try to fix Barbie's lips because the uh, lips had cracked a little bit. So the little girl tried to fix it by using a felt tip pen. But she wasn't very good at coloring. And she overcolored and the ink leaked into the plastic. And the little girl was just uh, devastated, uh, you know, by, you know, what had happened to her doll. She, so horrific, I can't even show you. Uh, even Ken was horrified by, by this. And um, it was one of the, the problems I couldn't solve. Uh, we tried all kinds of solvents. Didn't work because the ink had soaked into the PVC, into the polyvinyl uh, chloride. So she was stuck with this uh, disfigured doll. Anyway, that's my memory of, uh, of Barbie. So anyway, if, uh, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it is worthwhile to read a little bit about the whole story of, uh, of Jack Ryan and, and uh, uh, Ruth Handler and 
uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it then. Uh, you you get a lot more out of the movie. It's much more. It's much deeper than it first seems. It really is not a children's movie, but you've got to know the story uh, uh, behind it. And then you'll catch the little references, you know, to the IRS people coming into the into the office, uh, etc. All right. Well, let's get down to more serious business. The other movie, of course, was Oppenheimer. How many of you saw that? Um, very, very well done. The story of Robert Oppenheimer, of course, who was a, a physicist who led the Manhattan uh, Project. And um, they did a very good job in general, uh, although it was three hours. Uh, I don't think any movie should be three hours. Uh, I think it could have been edited you know, two and a half quite easily. But uh, certainly uh, Cillian uh, Murphy, the Irish actor who played Oppenheimer, did it extremely well and even looked like him. And he, very, very good job. So let's take a look at behind this movie, because really it didn't tell the scientific story. I, I guess they decided that that was a bit too complicated to tell in, in the movie. But let me see if I can simplify it for you, because it is a fascinating adventure that begins in 1896 with the discovery of uh, radioactivity and, of course, culminates with the atom bomb and also the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Henri Becquerel was a French physicist who, in 1896, made an accidental discovery, discovery that eventually would change the world, because he didn't quite realize it at, at that time. He had a piece of uh, uranium oxide, which is a naturally occurring ore, uh, that he had sitting on a bench top. He had some photographic film in a drawer in that desk, just purely accidental. But when he wanted to use this photographic film, and he opened the drawer and took out this unexposed photographic film, he saw an image on it, the image of this piece of mineral that had been sitting on top of the bench. Now, that was a stunning finding because it seemed that somehow something from that mineral had penetrated the desk and exposed the film. Of course, he didn't really understand what, what this was but he documented it. And this was further explored by the Curies, Marie and Pierre Curie. Uh, Marie, when she was looking for a research project to do for her doctorate, actually consulted Becquerel. And Becquerel told her about this rather mysterious thing that had happened. So, Marie and Pierre began to explore minerals to see what on earth was, was going on. And uh, so they looked uh, for, they looked at uranium and they wanted to see if there were other kinds of materials that would also do this, give off what they thought was some sort of rays. Well, the idea of an X-ray already had been introduced by Röntgen, who also accidentally had happened to found, find uh, such um, emanations. So they searched for all kinds of minerals that were giving off these rays that could expose photographic paper. And they found uh, one which pitch blend, uh, which is again a naturally uh, occurring mineral, which is uh, mostly uranium, because they were studying the same thing that Becquerel was studying. Uranium was giving off these mysterious rays. But what they discovered was that it was more radioactive, that it gave off more of these mysterious rays 
then could be accounted for by the ura uranium. So there was something else in there. And they decided that they would find what that was. So they started with large amounts of pitch blend, extracted all of the uranium from it to see what would be left behind. And they did this themselves physically, hard, hard labor. And they discovered two elements that had never been seen before. One of them was polonium, which they named after Poland, which was Marie Curie's homeland. And the other one was radium. So here were now uranium, polonium, radium, three substances that were giving off these mysterious rays. Well, the first one to be able to explain exactly what was going on here was Ernest Rutherford. He was at McGill. He uh, originally hailed from New Zealand, uh, but he did a lot of his work here at McGill. And what he found was an explanation for what these mysterious rays were. The uranium atom was by itself decomposing. It was said to be radioactive. It was active because it was giving off radiation. The term actually was coined by Marie Curie. Well, when you have uranium, it just spontaneously decomposes. It changes into another element, thorium. And that changes into another element, etc. This is called the uranium cascade. And this was Rutherford's explanation. So what was happening that Becquerel and the Curies had, had seen was that this naturally occurring element, uranium, was decomposing, changing into a different element. How was it doing that? By giving off something to make it smaller, to break down into the smaller atoms. Well, he still wasn't clear exactly what was happening, but then he designed an experiment, Rutherford did, that turned out to be one of the most critical experiments in, in history. This was the so-called gold foil experiment, where he took some radium, and again, this was the element that Marie Curie had discovered, which was giving off these mysterious rays, and he directed those mysterious rays at a piece of gold foil. And the amazing thing was that most of those rays went right through the gold foil. It just penetrated, meaning it didn't hit anything. And that seemed really, really bizarre. How could this be? And he said that this, this was uh, like uh, shooting a bullet at a piece of tissue paper and uh, have the bullet bounce back from that tissue paper, although most bullets would go right through, but some would bounce back. Well, how could it be that some of these rays would go through and some would bounce back? And he came up with the idea that the gold was actually made up of atoms, and most of those atoms were empty space. There was a nucleus where the mass of the atom was concentrated, but the rest of it was empty space, which later we found were filled with electrons moving around very quickly. So this is how the gold foil experiment worked because most of those rays, whatever they were, were going through the empty space. But sometimes they would hit the nucleus and then bounce back. Well, Rutherford eventually got a Nobel Prize, uh, of course, for this, but he pushed this all further. And he was able to determine what those mysterious rays actually were. They were the nuclei of helium which was another element. And he discovered that these bits of, of helium, when he exposed them to nitrogen, 
the nitrogen would change into oxygen. This really was sort of the, the uh, alchemical quest come to reality, the changing of one substance into another. So nitrogen changed into, into oxygen. So Rutherford had developed this idea of the atom, a nucleus in which there were the mass called protons. And then in 1932, James Chadwick discovered that there was something else that was present in the nucleus of the atom. And those were neutrons. Protons had a positive charge, electrons had a negative charge, neutrons had no charge at all. So now the theory of the atom or the picture of the atom became a little bit more elucidated. In the middle of an atom, in the nucleus, there were positive particles called protons, others equal in mass to the protons, but no charge and circulating around this were the, uh, were the electrons. So now scientists had a pretty good idea of what an atom looked like. And then in uh, 1933, Leo Szilard, who was a Hungarian physicist, Hungarians played an incredibly large role in the development of, uh, of nuclear science, especially in, in the bomb. Leo Szilard was Hungarian, Edward Teller was, uh, was Hungarian, there were a number of others in there. So anyway, he conceived of the idea that these neutrons, which Chadwick had, uh, had discovered, could be removed from a nucleus and they could be targeted towards something else, towards another atom. And this could conceivably cause a reaction that he referred to as a chain reaction. And he even visualized that this could be used to make a bomb. And then in 1934, Enrico Fermi, Italian physicist, put this to practice. And he found that when he targeted neutrons against other atoms, those other atoms would change. He didn't really realize what was going on. He didn't realize that when he bludgeoned uranium atoms with neutrons, that they actually broke apart. But he did realize that something was happening and he worked out these techniques whereby neutrons could be used to target other atoms. And then the huge discovery was made. And this was made in 1938 uh, by uh, Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner in Germany. Uh, Otto Hahn had actually trained under Rutherford here in Montreal. Lise Meitner, who uh, Einstein had actually called the uh, Marie Curie of Germany, uh, although she was not German, she was actually Austrian, she was born in, in, in Vienna. Uh, she was born Jewish, but at a very early stage in her life, I think she was 18 or 19, she converted to Christianity. Anyway, to, to working together with uh, Otto Hahn, they explained what was going on, what Fermi had not realized in his experiment. Fermi had bombarded uranium with, with neutrons, saw that something was happening, but didn't understand what. They explained it. This was nuclear fission. The uranium atom was breaking apart into smaller pieces. It was really like a bullet hitting a target and smashing it, in this case, smashing it into two pieces. But the two pieces, which happen to be two other elements, barium and krypton, the mass of those was slightly less than the mass of the original uranium. And this is where Lise Meitner and Otto Hahn made the real breakthrough. What had happened to that mass? Well, they knew about Einstein's theory. And of course, the classic equation, 
E is equal to mc squared, where E is the energy, m is mass, C is the speed of light. What had happened here was that the missing mass had been converted into energy. So this really was the birth of the concept of creating a nuclear bomb. If you could scale this up, break apart enough uranium atoms by targeting them with neutrons, you could release tremendous amount of energy. This was immediately realized also by uh, Szilard and, and Einstein. And in 1939, they wrote a letter. Actually, Einstein was the main signatory of the letter. They wrote, they wrote a letter to President Roosevelt saying that the Germans had discovered this and that the Germans were working on developing a nuclear weapon. The letter is, of course, a historical classic, and here it is, as you can see, addressed to F.D. Roosevelt, President of the U.S. White House, Washington, D.C., from Albert Einstein, uh, telling Roosevelt of this possibility, and that Roosevelt has to take this seriously because the Germans are on the verge of creating a nuclear weapon. The truth is that the Germans were not on the verge of creating a nuclear weapon. They were really far from it. But they didn't know that uh, at that time. Uh, Lisa Meitner had left Germany, actually, because of her Jewish heritage. Uh, you know, it didn't matter that she had converted to Christianity because she had been born Jewish. She, she, uh, had to flee Germany and went to Sweden, where uh, she continued to collaborate with uh, uh, Otto Hahn by, by mail. Anyway, Roosevelt uh, understood the importance of this. And this is what began the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project, of course, was the creation of the uh, atom bomb. Why was it called the Manhattan Project? Anyone know? The original offices of the um, physicists who were going to work on this were in New York, in Manhattan, on Broadway, at 270 Broadway. This is where the Manhattan Project began. The building is still there. This is it. And it all happened somewhere on this floor. Uh, now most of it has been converted into condos. And uh, the, I think the bottom floors are office buildings. But there is somebody who lives in the space where essentially the, all the ideas about the atom bomb were put together. Well, this was when uh, General Leslie Groves, who was in charge of the uh, whole project, uh, enlisted uh, Oppenheimer, who at that time was already a uh, professor of uh, physics at uh, University of California. And um, they uh, decided that they needed a very remote location where the research would be done and where, if it were successful, they could actually test it and explode a bomb. Of course, as you know, they selected a site in uh, New Mexico, known as Los Alamos, because uh, it essentially was a desert with very little population uh, uh, around it. And uh, this was an ideal place uh, to do secret research, because, of course, uh, everything could be controlled, could be fenced in, uh, etc. And uh, it also was far enough from populations so that if they ever got around to actually testing something, th this would be an ideal location. But at that time, when they started up the work at Los Alamos, uh, they still didn't know how this was going to happen. But the critical experiment was done also in 1942. Now you can see that a lot happened here in a very short time. 1942 was the establishment of the Manhattan Project and also the year that the critical experiment was done. 
And this was done at University of Chicago, actually just underneath the stands of a football stadium, which, which uh, before had been some sort of racquetball court. And this is where Enrico Fermi and Leo Szilard built the world's first essentially nuclear reactor. And this was based on uranium, uranium decomposing, releasing neutrons that would hit other uranium atoms that would then break apart, release more neutrons, hit others, and with each such fission, some energy would be released. That place also, of course, is uh, very historic, and there is a plaque University of Chicago, where this was done, man achieved here the first self-sustaining chain reaction, thereby initiated the controlled release of nuclear energy. Now, let me explain to you what, how this works, because although it could be gone into in great depth, the basics are actually very simple. You have uranium. Uranium is naturally radioactive which means that it decomposes. And it decomposes by giving off neutrons. But those neutrons then can hit another uranium atom and break it apart into smaller pieces, at the same time releasing more neutrons. And if you have enough uranium to start with, the so-called critical mass of uranium, then you can get a sustained chain reaction. What does that mean? That means that you get a collision of a neutron with uranium, it breaks apart, more neutrons are released, they hit more uranium atoms, those release more neutrons, etc., etc. And if you have enough uranium to start with, you will eventually get an explosion because each one of these fissions produces some energy. So now with the work of Fermi having been done, now they knew how to proceed. So just in two years, Los Alamos, where there had been absolutely nothing, all of a sudden it was a whole town full of physicists, full of researchers of all kinds. And it was uh, uh, kept secret, which is really quite amazing. Now, of course, that was still, you know, obviously before internet or anything like that. So it was easier to keep things secret. But it's quite amazing that, that uh, you could have a whole facility like this that really nobody knew about, except as we later found out, the Russian spies. They knew about it, Stalin knew about it. Anyway, Roosevelt died, and uh, Truman, of course, became president. He had known nothing about this. Even the vice president of the United States did not know about the Manhattan Project, which is quite something. Right. I guess probably not in today's terms. Trump doesn't didn't know about anything about anything. <laughs> so anyway, so um, Roosevelt found out about um, uh, the possibility of the bomb, and of course he said, uh, uh, "Go ahead." Uh, the U.S. was already at war with Germany, and. Um, of course, the, the plan was to, to end the war with a nuclear bomb if they could, uh, they, they could achieve it. Well, they were able to achieve it because uh, by 1945, they had done enough experiments in the laboratory uh, to know that this was a possibility and they were ready to give it a try. And July 13, 1945, the bomb was prepared and uh, the site where this was going to be done was called Trinity, which was near uh, Los Alamos. And here is the uh, bomb that's going to be tested, being hoisted atop this uh, scaffold that uh, had been uh, built. 
And uh, again, this was you know very properly portrayed in in the movie, uh, all of the you know excitement uh, uh, about it, and uh, they pushed the button. They didn't know if it was going to work or not. July sixteen forty five, and there it is. That was the first uh, atomic explosion in history, and uh, it was uh, it was awesome, and. Uh, the, the whole area reverberated. Uh, it could be seen from great distances uh, away. Uh, today, the site itself uh, is, of course, of historical importance, and you can actually go on and uh, visit it. Uh, there it is, marked by the monument there, which is exactly where that bomb was when it uh, exploded. There's the monument. Trinity site where the world's first nuclear device was exploded, July 16, 1945. So that was, um, of course, a historic moment. Uh, Truman uh, decided that uh, he better tell Stalin uh, about this, but it turned out that uh, spies had, in fact, infiltrated Los Alamos, and he knew about this. Stalin already knew. So Truman made the decision to um, use the bomb. Now, by this time, Germany had surrendered. So the only enemy left was Japan. And there was a lot of controversy about what to do. Most advised Truman to do uh, a demonstration is to tell Japan that they were going to drop this bomb some remote location on some remote island and invite the Japanese press to see what uh, this would do, hoping that they would then surrender. Uh, Truman decided that that was not going to work. And he decided to go ahead and, and drop it. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about what the target would be. And eventually, they decided on uh, on Hiroshima, as, as you know. And uh, Colonel Paul Tibbets was chosen as the pilot. Uh, the plane was the Enola Gay. And the bomb that would be dropped was called Little Boy. It had in it two pieces of uranium, neither of which was of critical mass. So neither could cause a nuclear explosion. What had to be done was that the two had to be joined to get a large enough mass so that you had enough neutrons vibrating around inside that mass to create the fission. How was that done? Well, they would be propelled together with an explosion, a conventional explosion. So there was a tube inside with the two pieces of uranium, some gunpowder. The gunpowder would be lit. It would smash the two pieces of uranium together, you critical mass, get an explosion. Now, they knew that this would had a good chance of working because of the experiments that had been done at the Trinity site. But it certainly was not guaranteed. I mean, this was very sophisticated you know, technology. A lot of things had to go had to go right. And it did. It did. And on August 6, 1945, uh, the bomb was detonated about 1,800 feet over uh, Hiroshima. Uh, the Enola Gay was about nine miles away already, you know, because of it, the bomb was dropped from about 30,000 feet. So by the time it exploded, of course, it was designed that the plane could be far enough away so that it wouldn't be blown out of the sky by the explosion. But it almost was. The explosion was bigger than they thought that it would be. And the Enola you know, Gay rocked, you know, from the uh, explosion. The um, devastation was incredible. Uh, essentially, Hiroshima was wiped off the map. Uh, almost, you know, total uh, devastation. Uh, and uh, Japan did not surrender, uh, which was really quite incredible. 
seeing what you know what what they saw had happened but anyway they they did not surrender so um, uh, Truman decided that uh, they would do this again and on August 9th the uh, bomb was dropped on Nagasaki again as you can see total uh, devastation the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was so-called fat man and uh, this was quite different in the chemistry from the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima what's the difference the bomb that was used on Hiroshima was a uranium fission bomb so as I explained to you it had some uranium 235 neutrons hit it it breaks apart into two pieces, releases more neutrons, which then hit more uranium, etc. You get a chain reaction. The bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was a plutonium bomb. Plutonium, when it is bombarded with neutrons, also breaks apart into two pieces, also releases neutrons. But more mass is lost here than here. So therefore, more energy is released. This was a more powerful bomb than on, on Hiroshima. And uh, this was enough to convince the Japanese. And uh, Japan surrendered. And, you know, as you well know, there's been a great controversy ever since about whether or not this uh, should have been used. And um, the great concerns about when it will be used next. As you know, Putin is, is constantly rattling his saber, saying that he's prepared to use conventional uh, nuclear weapons. What do we mean by conventional nuclear weapons? It just means that it is a, a smaller uh, explosion. But there's no such thing as a small nuclear explosion. Any kind of nuclear explosion will have catastrophic uh, uh, consequences. Now, there's also the, the question of how um, Oppenheimer, who was, of course, head of this project, how he thought about it after. And here, I think the, the, the movie actually is not accurate, because the movie kind of portrays that he was regretful of his role in this. There, there is no historical evidence of that. In fact, he said many times, he did not regret heading the uh, Manhattan Project. The only thing he regretted that it wasn't done in time to drop the bomb on Germany. Uh, so there, the, he did say that 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 uh, uh, he didn't make the decision to drop the bomb on Japan, and that he was ambivalent about that. But he was not ambivalent about the role that he played in developing uh, the bomb. Anyway, uh, in 1945, uh, Oppenheimer resigned as director of the Los Alamos lab, and he um, took a job as professor at, at Caltech. And he had become, of course, a very, very famous uh, man. He was on the cover of Life magazine, number one thinker on atomic energy. He was on the cover of uh, Time magazine, and he was repeatedly called the father of the atomic bomb, which is really not correct in terms of, of, of science. He really did head the project. I mean, he was the coordinator of the Manhattan Project, no question of, about that. But he didn't make the critical scientific discoveries. That was Lise Meitner and Otto Hahn, Enrico Fermi, Leo Szilard. Uh, Szilard is portrayed in, in the movie, although his accent is ridiculous, it's not a Hungarian accent. I don't know what kind of accent it is. I mean, they should have come up with someone who could do a proper Hungarian accent, which is not difficult to do. Anybody can do Hungarian accent. 
but uh, they didn't. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so there, there's a bit of a problem of calling Oppenheimer the father of the bomb. Uh, what he was, was the coordinator of the Manhattan Project. Anyway, he died uh, at the age of 62, young age. Uh, he died of um, cancer of the larynx because, as is commonly portrayed in the movie, he was a, a smoker. He smoked all the time. He was a chain smoker, and that eventually uh, caught up to him. So anyway, this is a bit of a background in, uh, to the movie, and uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it is certainly worthwhile uh, seeing. But do a bit more reading, you know, about Oppenheimer. It's, it's, it's always more valuable to see a movie when you know something behind it, just as I told you with the Barbie movie. Uh, Hiroshima was almost totally devastated, as I said, but there was one building uh, that was left. And uh, that, of course, has become the Hiroshima Memorial. It is still there in Hiroshima. There it is, modern, modern day. Uh, and it's uh, a reminder, of course, of uh, what happened the first time that a uh, nuclear weapon was uh, ever used. Uh, repeated just a few days later in Nagasaki, but hopefully not to be repeated uh, again. But as you know, many countries in the world now have nuclear weapons, thousands and thousands of them. Uh, one of these is, of course, enough to wipe out a city. You do not need thousands and thousands, but uh, both the Americans and the Russians, of course, have stockpiled huge numbers of, uh, of nuclear weapons. But of course, there is another side to nuclear energy, and that is the peaceful use of nuclear energy, which of course is becoming more and more interesting these days, because let's face it, we are going to run out of petroleum. We are going to run out of coal. These are the so-called fossil fuels. Right? The Earth is a finite size, so there can only be a certain amount of petroleum that is, you know, in the ground. I mean, there still is enough probably for, certainly within our lifetime, and, you know, 100 years hence, but it is clear that eventually we will run out, so we will need to have some sort of energy. And while solar panels, wind power, tidal power, batteries and all of this are going to have a, an impact, uh, it's not going to be enough to replace the fossil fuels. But nuclear energy can do that. I mean, we saw with the bomb, of course, the tremendous amount of energy that could be released. Well, that energy could also be harnessed. And it's harnessed in a nuclear power plant. And you will generally recognize nuclear power plants because they have these giant cooling towers. No nuclear reaction happens in there. There's nothing but hot water. That's all it is. And you see some steam coming off. It's water that is used. I'll show you in a minute why we need water. And this water is recirculated, uh, gets heated up again, and then has to be uh, cooled. So what happens in a nuclear power plant? You have a reaction chamber where you have uranium, exactly like you have in a bomb. The uranium will release neutrons, it hits other uranium atoms, they fission, and you get energy. Well, what do you do with this energy? You use it to heat water. So here's water that circulates through the nuclear reactor. It gets hot. When water gets hot, it turns into steam. So as it turns into steam, it turns a turbine. That turbine is linked to a generator and you get electricity. All electricity is generated that way. What you need to have is a coil of wire that turns surrounded by a magnet, and then you get electricity flowing through the wire. So it's always a question of how you get that turbine to turn. This is the key piece turned by hot water. Well, that hot water you can get by burning coal, you can get it by burning oil, 
you can get it by water power, right? A waterfall, like luckily we have here in, in, in Quebec, or you can use the energy that is generated in a nuclear reaction. So the, once the water has done its job, it has to be cooled back down so that it can circulate again. That's where you, that's where you see the cooling towers. Now that water is not water like what you get out of your tap. Well, essentially it is, but it has something added to it. And what it has added to it is some lithium. And the reason for that is because lithium can absorb neutrons. Remember that neutrons are being released in this nuclear reaction. The problem is to make sure that you don't have an explosion so that you don't have what we see in the atom bomb. So you've got to control for what basically amounts to loose neutrons. So there's some lithium dissolved in the water because it can absorb neutrons and when it absorbs neutrons, it breaks down to helium and, uh, and tritium. Tritium is what we call an isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element composed of one proton and one electron. Tritium is one proton, two neutrons in the nucleus and one electron. This is radioactive. Tritium is radioactive. So that water, that flows through the reactor eventually becomes radioactive. Now, what do we mean by it's radioactive? Instead of being H2O, some of that water absorbs the tritium and becomes HOT or TOT. That water is radioactive. This is a problem because that radioactive tritium breaks apart, releases radiation in the form of what we call alpha particles. Anyway, I mean, that's not critical. The important thing to understand is that the water, the cooling water has become radioactive, but it is in a closed system. So none of it gets out. But you know what happened in 2011, Fukushima, the earthquake. Well, what happened was that the result of the earthquake was that the generators were knocked out, the pumps were knocked out at Fukushima, so that there was no longer any circulation of the water, it was not being cooled, it get hotter and hotter and hotter, and uh, eventually there wasn't enough cooling of the reactor and you had a fire burst out in the reactor. This, of course, was a very dangerous situation because there was radioactive material being released. So they sprayed huge amounts of water on there. But remember that the water that was being released from the reactor was radioactive. So what you had here was a massive amount of water from the spray and from what was released from the reactor, all of which was radioactive. What did they do? As much as possible, they collected all that water and stored it in these giant steel tanks around the reactor. How many of these tanks? Over a thousand. This is what it looks like now. So this holds all of the water that they've managed to collect, which is radioactive. However, this accident happened about 12 years ago. The half-life of tritium is about 12 years. So every 12 years, you only have half as much left. So we have a lot less now than at the time of the explosion. The radioactivity in here is at a very low level. But the question has been, what do you do with this? Because what if there's another earthquake? You can't risk all of this being released at the same time. So the decision was made to release this water bit by bit, 
very slowly into the ocean because there it gets diluted very quickly and the radioactivity becomes very quickly irrelevant. So the decision was made. But of course, there was a lot of concern, a lot of alarm this because just the idea of releasing radioactive material into the environment scares people. But the calculations had been made, very, very careful calculations uh, about the amount of radioactivity that could be released. And, you know, the conclusion is that it doesn't present any kind of, of risk. But nevertheless, people are panicking uh, because they're worried about, you know, radioactivity. Well, doses matter about everything, as you know. Toxicity depends on dose. It is the same thing with radioactivity. We, believe it or not, are all radioactive. We all have potassium in our body. One of the isotopes of potassium is potassium-40, that's radioactive. When you eat a banana, there's potassium in there. Some of that is radioactive. But the amount is trivial. We don't worry about it. When you get an X-ray, you're exposed to radioactivity, but you still don't worry about it because the dose is not high enough. Although, of course, it's much higher than what you would get from a banana. Repeated x-rays can be an issue. So dosage matters. The amount of radioactivity released from there into the ocean is insignificant. It's not something to worry about. But it is causing a huge problem to the fishing industry there because of public perception. Japan sells almost all of its fish to China. China isn't buying it because they claim a risk, but there is no risk. There is no radioactivity, but people fear it. And this is destroying the Japanese uh, uh, fishing industry. So as you can see, there are all sorts of consequences uh, of nuclear energy. And uh, the story, of course, which I've, I've encapsulated for you here is you know, scientific detail is much more uh, intense. But the basic idea is uh, relatively simple. Uranium is an unstable atom. It breaks down. As it breaks down, it releases neutrons. Those neutrons hit another atom of uranium. That breaks apart. The fragments that it breaks apart into have smaller mass than the original atom. That change in mass is converted to energy. That's the energy in the nuclear bomb. Just the, that's the energy in the nuclear reactor. That's the energy that we have inside our bodies in terms of the radioactive potassium. But it's always a question of, of how much. Yeah. No, they didn't. They were made. Oh, so they were made very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they made over a thousand of those stainless steel containers. Yeah. Uh, of course, people are concerned about nuclear, nuclear energy because, you know, they know of Fukushima, they know of Chernobyl, etc. But I can tell you that historically, the number of people who have died in coal mines, who have died in petroleum refineries is, is monumental in comparison to uh, anything that nuclear energy has, has, has done. I mean, uh, the history of, of coal mining is, is terrible. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have died in coal mining, you know. Yes, and then of course, inhaling the coal dust, yeah. No, uh, nuclear fusion is, is actually the, 
the opposite of fission, what you have is small atoms joining together to make a bigger one. But again, the mass of the smaller ones is more than the mass of the bigger ones, so you're releasing uh, energy. But uh, the, the technical details there are, are, are very complex because in order to fuse together two nuclei, you need an awful lot of energy to push them together. Uh, so that, in, in what is called the hydrogen bomb, that energy comes from first detonating a conventional nuclear bomb, like what I told you, and using that energy to fuse. Uh, fusion, of course, is, is what happens in the sun. All of the energy what we get from the sun is the result of two hydrogen atoms joining together to make helium. And if we could harness that on Earth, uh, that would be a, a fantastic source of energy. But of course, it, any time that you are creating a large amount of energy, there's always a risk. I mean, you know, no matter how you, how you are doing that, when you are <laughs> producing a lot of heat, there's always the chance of, of that heat doing something you don't want it to do. But I think we're quite far away from uh, seeing nuclear fusion. No, the Manhattan Project was totally secret. Yeah, nobody knew. But again, remember, this was 1940s. You know, it was much easier to keep these secrets uh, secrets then. Stanley. Uh, we discussed yes, for reasons of time. Three Mile Island took place in the 1970s. How did that differ from Fukushima? Uh, Three Mile Island, there, there was no, no external accident. I mean, there was no earthquake or anything like that. That was uh, something going wrong uh, inside of the, of the plant with the uh, cooling system. And whenever something goes wrong with the pumps of the cooling system and the reactor overheats, that's when you have the problem. So th that was essentially a mechanical problem. But uh, there was no meltdown there. There was uh, very little consequence of Three Mile Island. It's closed now. Three Mile Island is no longer an operational. Uh... Was it closed because of what happened? Yeah. So they determined that there was no way to fix it. Yeah. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. The world of rail politics. I always hear that Iran is near, 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 near a nuclear bomb. What is it that they are waiting for? Enough uranium or enough plutonium. Uh, the uranium that occurs in nature is made up of two isotopes, uranium-238 and uranium-235. The difference between them is the number of neutrons they have in the nucleus. About 98% of all the uranium in nature is uranium-238, which is not fissionable. Uranium-235 is. So the question is, how do you separate out the small amount of uranium-235, which is, requires very sophisticated technology? And this, this is the... Uh, the problem that you don't know if the if the Iranians have that technology, uh, they probably do. They probably have a a, a bomb. Thank you. But you know, they really, when it comes to to to, to the bomb, it's the deterrence that's the factor. I mean, uh, Iran may have the bomb. What are they going to do with it? I mean, if they ever contemplated to use it, you know who would wipe them off the map within minutes. Yeah. In 1945, how many bombs did the Americans have? The, the, those two. Yes, they only had those two. Yeah. But then, of course, by the 1950s, <laughs> 
both sides had a lot. Yeah. What was the problem internally? Was it a meltdown or how do you complain? The what? Chernobyl. Chernobyl? Uh, Chernobyl was, again, it, it was not, uh, <laughs> there's no external accident, there was no, no earthquake or anything like that. Uh, there they had, a, very much like Three Mile Island, they had an internal problem. Their cooling system broke down somehow, and apparently it was a very primitive power plant. Uh, Russian technology was not very sophisticated uh, at that, that time. How they contain it? They didn't contain it. I mean, they, they, they actually had a meltdown. The they nuclear reactor basically melted away, melted into the ground. Uh, so what the only thing that they could do, which they've done, is poured concrete all over it to encapsulate it. But there, a very significant amount of radioactivity was released. So there, there were and will be a lot of cancers uh, attributed to Chernobyl. Whereas Three Mile Island, there was no radioactivity released. Yeah. You mentioned uh, after now that so many countries, they call it stockpiles. Yeah. How safe they are? How they, how, how they uh, control that? Yeah, well, uh, each each side. I mean, the U.S. and and and, and Russians have thousands of nuclear uh, nuclear bombs. Most of them are on underground. Uh, they're in in. Yes. Yes. But it it has to be lit, you and know. Another one, another question. After the war, certain restriction. Some country not allowed. Is uh, Japan and Germany included? No. They, they, can they do? No. Japan and Germany did not have uh, nuclear they bombs. No. The only countries that have, that we know for sure, of course, the, 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 the Russians, the US, India, uh, China, uh, Pakistan, uh, Israel, uh, England, France. That's it. That's it. That's it. I mean, <laughs> but all of those have enough to destroy the rest of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the word radiation scares a lot of people because, uh, you know, it has a scary connotation. But, I mean, radiation just means the propagation of energy through space. I mean, light is radiation, radio waves are radiation, you know, ultraviolet light is, is radiation. It all depends on what kind of radiation you're talking about. I mean, the radiation that we have from uh, uh, from a bomb, uh, the release of, of neutrons, that's a dangerous thing. But the tritium that we're talking about here is minimally radioactive. That's not harmful. So, you know, it, it, you have to ask the question, what is giving rise to radioactivity and how much of that material is there? Num, num, you know, numbers matter. <laughs> Well, you know, if you don't trust them, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. They, they, where at the... Well, where the Trinity site was, I showed you, there's a monument there, you can, you, you can go visit it. In, uh, in Las Vegas, which is not too far away, there's an atomic energy museum, which is very, very good. And there they show you the whole history of, uh, of the bomb. Yeah, that's well worth visiting in Las Vegas. Yeah. In, Canada, in the list of 
atomic bomb countries. You didn't mention Canada. No, we don't have. We don't have. Okay. No. We have nuclear reactors. Okay. Yeah. How long does it take to enrich naturally occurring uranium to uranium that's good for building the bomb? It depends on whether you have the right technology. I mean, to, uh, when they did it for the original bomb in, in, uh, in 1942, it took about a year. Uh, today, with sophisticated technology, it will take less. And, uh, you know, the question is just what technology Iran has. Then no one seems to know that for for sure, but it's a pretty good guess that they have they have been able to make enough U-235 to make a bomb. So in fact, Iran does have a choice of purchasing and rich uranium from other countries who may not have the bomb, but they have the, the process I guess in theory it's possible, but the U.S. is not going to sell them any. <laughs> Russians might, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Is the heavy water connected to something to do with the The what? Heavy water. Like the German used to have a place in Norway that tried to bring over. Oh, that's that's a different story. Uh, that was heavy water, D2O. Uh, D2O, uh, like what I told you about lithium, has the ability to absorb neutrons. So the technology that the Germans were working on, they were using not lithium but D2O in order to try to capture any loose uh, neutrons, and. Uh, this is why, of course, the Allies targeted that, that factory in, in Norway. Uh, that was a very, that was a big thing when they managed to blow that up because uh, heavy water is difficult to make and the Germans had made enough of it. But uh, as, as we found out, you know, after the war from the German scientists, they, they were actually nowhere near uh, producing a bomb. Heavy water, that's the way they created their... Yes, well, now, now the technology to make heavy water is, is, is much better known. And, uh, yeah. Do you have any personal knowledge about uh, Oppenheimer and Hillard who uh, crashed uh, during the Manhattan Project? Yes, well, it, yeah, the, they, yeah, they, it, it wasn't over the bomb that they they uh, clashed. Uh, Sillard was bent on making a hydrogen bomb, which was a much more potent bomb. Uh, Oppenheimer opposed that. This is what the, their fight was about. Uh, also, Sillard and Fermi didn't get along very well, but they managed to work together. I mean, there's a lot of personality uh, conflicts there. November, you know, in uh, my guild, you know, for the for uh, people, uh, elderly people, you know. Uh, I signed up, and uh, I don't have much background, and uh, but they say it's an hour lecture. I'm really looking forward to. You don't. You don't need background. Don't need background. Because of my uh, Hungarian origin. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, I understand that citizens today are working on nuclear, nuclear fusion, and they say it is safe that if they can make batteries from it, it will fuel, settle a lot of the problems. Yeah, don't hold your breath. <laughs> nuclear fusion is way in the distance. Not, not going to happen soon. Okay, we'll see you next month.